pressure continues to be normal. Our immediate table pressure looks good. Probably not. Water towers fly! Yes! Ego down phenomenal. Water down by SCE dog. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Good evening, everyone from Cape Canaveral, Florida. We're bringing you live coverage of yet another Falcon 9 launch. We hope you're not sick of them because we got another one coming up in just under 38 minutes. Uh, this will be carrying the Galaxy 33 and 34 satellites for Intelsat. And we'll be getting into what that means, what this mission will be doing, and an interesting first happening on this mission. Uh, but before all that, I'd like to introduce who's with me here. So first off, we have Adrian Bile. How are we doing, Adrian? I am doing just wonderful. How about you, Ian? I'm doing great. Excited for another Falcon 9 launch. And uh, this might be a jellyfish. Again, we're going to dive into all that later, but should be a very pretty launch tonight if things line up correctly. Uh, we're also joined by Chris Gebhardt. How are we doing, Chris? I am doing just fine. Eager to see the dual satellites on board this mission lift off to begin their epic journey to geostationary orbit. Absolutely well said. And finally, in the field, providing us this great camera view and who will be tracking this camera or this uh, launch tonight, uh, we have Thomas Berghart. How are we doing, Thomas, out there? I'm doing well, Ian. It is a crystal clear evening here on the Space Coast, not a cloud in the sky. And for those who may have been paying attention to Twitter with our slight T0 just to 20 p.m. Eastern time, this liftoff is currently set to take place just after sunset. So, I'm wondering if we're going to have some spectacular visuals for tonight's launch, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and the only way to find out is to uh, stick around and watch it alongside of us. So just over 35 minutes away, we're just about to get into a propellant loading on Falcon 9. Um, but first off, Chris, so what are we looking at here? So we have Falcon 9 on the pad, obviously, but what are these satellites it's carrying? Where are they going? Yeah, so these are the Galaxy 33 and 34 satellites. Uh, they are built by Northrop Grumman, and they are for Intelsat. And this is part of what I've come to start calling the Great C-Band Replacement. Um, <laughs> Because an interesting thing sort of happened where you had a lot of satellites that were up in geostationary orbit that were using the C-band spectrum of the telecommunications frequencies that are approved for things like video, television, internet from space, those types of, you know, cell cellular signals as well. And the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the United States, a few years ago announced that as part of the new rollout of 5G services, that basically satellite operators needed to clear the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band of the C-band. And some satellites were able to accomplish this by simply modifying the frequencies that their systems operated on. And all satellite operators have to clear this spectrum by December 5th, 2023. So a little over one year to go with that. But some satellite operators could not do that and could not um, just simply tweak the frequencies. And some were also looking at aging satellites that they were going to have to replace anyway that had already been up there 15, 17 years and were nearing the end of their operational life anyway. So those that opted to replace is what we are now seeing launch. Uh, Atlas V uh, took uh, a, a couple of SES satellites up into orbit earlier this week, actually just two days ago from neighboring Pad 41, those were both part of C-band replacement operations. Uh, Falcon 9 launched um, a couple of satellites, launched SES-20, uh, uh, launched one SES satellite already as part of that replacement, and will launch two more in a dual launch configuration coming up here. So a lot of satellites getting launched up there to abide by the FCC C-band requirements that take effect at the end of next year. And that is, in a nutshell, what the payloads are doing on this mission. But this mission is going to be interesting for a very a, another reason, too, as an idiot. Uh, yes, so it will be. So what we're looking at on the pad is obviously Falcon 9. Now, it's a bit difficult to see here. You can kind of see through the transporter erector, but that first stage is scorched. Um, now, of course, as we all know, Falcon 9 has a reusable first stage and SpaceX likes to refly them even on customer missions. But this one's a little bit different. So what we're looking at here on the pad is booster 1060. Um, now, this is actually booster 1060-14. Now, the dash 14 at the end means that this will be its 14th mission. Uh, now, this is pretty significant on this specific mission because this is flying on a customer flight. 
Uh, now, SpaceX likes to fly their higher flight count boosters, and they've recently done a 14th flight of a booster uh, on their internal Starlink mission. So in case anything happens, they just lose their own payloads. They don't they don't lose a multi-million or multi-billion dollar customer payload. So the fact that they're flying a 14th mission of a booster on a customer payload is an incredible milestone, not just in trust from um, from Intelsat to fly on this booster, but also of confidence from SpaceX to let them fly on this booster. So pretty big milestone right there. So that's very cool tonight. And one thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning of the stream that I always love to forget to mention is that we always love answering your questions. So if you have any questions related to this launch vehicle, related to the satellites, what we're going to be seeing tonight, hit us up in chat with at NASA Spaceflight. And we're going to use some fancy software that Michael made uh, to go through your questions and we'll answer as many of them as we possibly can. But yeah, right now we're tracking just under 33 minutes until liftoff. We've had go for propellant loading and propellant loading has started. Uh, so right now RP-1 and liquid oxygen are flowing into the first stage of Falcon 9 and RP-1 is flowing into the second stage of Falcon 9. So looking very good tonight, just over 32 minutes until liftoff of Falcon 9. And the first question here from Kelly, I think uh, Chris or Thomas might be able to grab one or might be able to answer this. Is there any chance for a jellyfish tonight? So the uh, the famous jellyfish when the rocket launches into the sunset or into the sunrise, do we think we might might be able to see that tonight, Thomas or Chris? I think there's a big chance of that tonight because uh, liftoff is 17 minutes after sunset local time. So it's going to do something spectacular visually as it heads uphill. Yes. Awesome. Very so nice. We can, so we can say here, thanks uh, for the slight delay in the, in the targeting of this launch, because that might increase the chances here. So yeah. let's, let's hope we see that. And I mean, even now, if you look at the rocket, you look at the hiff in front of it, we're getting some beautiful colors from the sunset, which should only be getting better. Um, so yeah, the sun will be setting in the next few minutes, and then hopefully it'll set enough that we maybe get some jellyfish action tonight. So very cool to see that there. Thanks for the question, Kelly. Um, and we also have a question here from Kristen. What is the flight path for this launch? Um, so is it coming up ah. the East Coast like Starlink launches? So Chris, which direction is this flying out to to get to geostationary orbit? Yes, well, I hate to burst everyone's bubble because we just started saying, oh, it's going to do a spectacular thing, hopefully, but this one's going due east out of Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. So this is primarily going to be a Florida, Southern Georgia, Bahamas event, uh, visually speaking. Um, and that's because the two satellites are destined for geostationary orbit. And in order to do that, you launch due east to obtain the lowest possible inclination in respect to Earth's equator as possible. Uh, for the Falcon 9 launching from Florida, that uh, results in roughly a 28.6 degree inclination orbit. And then uh, when you uh, achieve that initial orbit, you coast down to the equator and then reignite the second stage engine to do the burn for geostationary transfer orbit. And this mission will actually be subsynchronous, so it'll actually inject the satellites, um, their geostationary a uh, transfer trajectory will actually be a little bit lower than what actual geo uh, than what actual geostationary orbit is and then the rest of the satellites will spend about 11 days um raising their orbits after that oh very cool um thanks for the question Kristen. Um, and now Stewie here is asking, what frequencies are 5G using that the satellites need to stop using? So I think I can answer that one real quick. I believe it is the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band. So the lower part of C-band, um, but the higher part of C-band is still, um, still available to satellite users to use. Um, so yeah, clearing out the lower part of the C-band for um, satellite use or for 5G usage, sorry. Um, and a question here from Curveless Sphere. It's actually a very interesting one here saying, so all Falcon 9 launch pads, all three of them, are being used within 24 hours of each other. Is this a sign that there may be a need for more pads sooner rather than later to keep up with demand? Uh, Adrian, do you have any thoughts on this? Do you think they might need more Falcon 9 pads? Do you think they're they're good with three for now? I, uh, I would wonder if there's any um, scale up of uh, Falcon 9 launch cadence in the future. Um, I think they, they might, yeah, I mean, it's a very obvious sign they are kind of on their limit right now. They couldn't really launch that much more anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, I would wonder if, because of a lot of these launches are Starlings, um, you would at some point just do not have any growth anymore because they hope to transfer these Starlink launches uh, to, uh, to Starship in the future. 
So if that is uh, in the future the case, that would, of course, take a lot of launches away from Falcon 9. Mm -hmm. And then I do not think they would need another pet anymore. So I think it's more like a situation where they where they yeah try to to launch as fast and as good as they can right now and uh, make use of the resources they have. Also yeah. worth noting that they only have three drone ships, and all three of SpaceX's missions over the last two days are utilizing a drone ship. Today, the first stage will be landing on a shoreful of gravitas. Uh, just read the instructions, supported the Crew 5 mission, and of course, I still love you, supported the Starlink mission from Vandy yesterday. And so, if this mission goes successfully, we should have three boosters on three drone ships. Um, not sure if that's the first time that's ever happened, but that's another limiting factor if they want to up the cadence even more. Not only would launch pads be a consideration, but so would drone ships. Although, maybe that's why they feel comfortable with three drone ships, because, well, Adding a new launch pad would be a massive undertaking, and they would need that in order to really need four drone ships, perhaps. Um, depends on the turnaround of a drone ship versus a launch pad. But I think SpaceX is going to be, be comfortable at the current launch rate for Falcon 9 for a bit. And like you said, Starship's going to start taking over a lot of those Starlink launches, uh, hopefully soon. Gotcha. Very cool. And uh, actually going off of that, when you're talking about drone ships, a uh, question from G.I. Joe here saying, um, why do some Falcons look like they're leaning once, once, they're, once why, sorry, why do some Falcons look like they're leaning once they're on the drone ship? Did a leg bend or is it just a photo illusion? Um, so Adrian, what happens there? Is it, did a leg bend? Did something crush or w what happens there? Yeah. It looks leaning. So there is a way that these legs literally crush. They are, have crush cores. To uh, basically, if if the leg gets to its limit, um, and would be would be close to maybe take a lot of load, they have these crush cores that then would collapse and take a bit of that load. And yes, that means a rocket would lean because if these crush cores crush, they the the rocket goes a bit into that direction and the leg is a bit shorter. So yes, they can look a bit. A leaning one uh, sometimes. We had some rockets that l were leaning a bit more um, in the, in the past, uh, but uh, usually it's just a, a little bit of leaning, and that's when okay. When you're talking about leaning, I remember. Uh, let's see, two come to mind. One is uh, the leaning tower of Tycom way oh, back. Oh yes, way back in the recovery program. It was like 2016, and then uh, what was the other one? Bulgaria sat too because that one slammed onto the drone ship. We also had that one that was barely like hanging on the side of the drone ship, right? Yeah, the yeah, it was one, one of the, the crew missions. Yeah, it was just I think one leg was kind of against the wall of the drone ship on the on uh -huh. the like that was that was crazy to see. Wasn't the Tycom booster? Didn't that get reused? Was that the one reused on Falcon Heavy demo? Yep, uh, ten twenty three. And now it's on display here at the Kennedy Space Center. It is not on dis it was put on display temporarily, but they it's in storage as of right now. Oh, it's not all right. So the, I thought that might have been the one that went to uh, the gateway exhibit, but I guess I haven't mixed up. Oh, oh no, that is yes, I totally forgot that gateway exists. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's open crazy. now. You got to go see it. Oh, got to get down to Florida. But yeah, thanks for the question though, GI Joe. Um, and we're gonna run through, ugh, excuse me, we're gonna run through some super chats right now, real quick. Uh, the super chats are a great way to support the work that we do because all these cameras, all the equipment, the data that we use, all the computers and the modems out here don't come cheap. So every little bit helps, and we genuinely appreciate that. And uh, everyone who I'm about to read off here has helped make streams like this possible. Um, so first off, from Rankly with five dollars, saying, "Who's tired of rocket launches, especially Twilight launches?" The answer is nobody, <laughs> and you can't convince them. Otherwise, they love our dedication. Well, I totally agree, Rankly. I am not tired of Twilight launches. Um, and speaking of Twilight launches, I remember the one Starlink launch about uh, two weeks ago going up the East Coast was insanely beautiful. And of course, uh, with my luck, I was not able to see it. But yeah, t Twilight launches are phenomenal. I'm very excited to see what we see here tonight. So thanks for the, the support, Rankly. We appreciate that. And Jerwa here gifting 10 Red Team memberships. So thank you very much, Jerwa, for the support. A regular in our uh, Super Chat queue. Thank you so much for all that you've done to help us out. You're gifting another 10 Red Team memberships. And everyone who they've who just got gifted a membership, we hope you enjoy all the perks there, the chat emotes and the behind-the-scenes uh, videos and all of that. So congratulations to all of you, and thank you, Jerwa. We appreciate that so much. 
Uh, and Nikon's in space, actually with a really interesting question that I don't know the answer to. So with $5 saying, three SpaceX launches in 24-ish hours, is that a record? Does anyone know if that was specifically a record? I am not 100% sure. I have to I have to admit here. Alex is typing in our back channel. Yeah, I, I'm waiting to bet he knows. Yes, yes, yes it's, it's a record. <laughs> Very cool. So yeah, I, I definitely see that being a record. That is a remarkable flight, um, of course, made possible by all three Falcon 9 pads that SpaceX has. So great to see that there. I'm sure in the future they could break that record, especially with Starship. Um, but very cool. And thank you, Nikon. We appreciate the question and the super chat. Uh, and the Captain Fuzzy here with $10 super chat saying, does it seem like they still want to use the oil rigs as launch platforms or have they abandoned that idea? Well, the last that we heard from Elon Musk, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, is that that is kind of a low priority right now, as in pretty much no priority. Um, their main priority in terms of Starship is just to get something into orbit uh, from the uh, Boca Chica launch site, then get Florida operational, and then see what they can do with the oil rigs from there. But I don't think there's been much work on the oil rigs um, other than stripping down some components they don't need anymore. So yeah, right now they seem to be in a bit of a hold pattern, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but thank you for the super chat. We appreciate that. And Plutonium239 here with $5 saying, well, what will Elon like uh, to do the first catch with the chops or to, to do the first booster catch with chopsticks or land it in the sea? And I think they're referring to booster seven there. Um, we have yeah. they plan. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah, they plan to use the chopsticks. Yeah, uh, that's at least what we've heard most recently. Yeah. Again, plans may change, but I, I, I guess that uh, kind of depends on how they feel about booster seven's reliability because you don't want to you know have like a missile <laughs> land on your launch pad but yeah it seems like they want to use the chopsticks on the first flight which should be a tremendous sight to see uh if everything goes well there or even if things don't go well it will still be amazing to see uh, and bruce fallen here thanks for being a pad rat member we really appreciate that support and we hope you enjoy all the perks that come with memberships and from Kelly here, a question that I actually have in the queue already, but I think this will flow into it perfectly. Any new news on Falcon Heavy? They're looking forward to the double RTLS. So, ah. Chris, any word on when Falcon Heavy is launching again? Well, a little bit. Um, today, uh, via Space Coast Live uh, cams that we have, uh, we were watching them uh, put up some of the cranes to begin uh, transforming the basically the launch mount where Falcon 9 attaches to the ground and attaches to its hold down bolts or hold down posts and um, and fueling systems. And we're going to show it to you now here over on Space Coast Live. You can see uh -huh. them getting that reaction frame and launch pad ready for its reconfiguration for Falcon Heavy. So Falcon Heavy's next. Um, it is the N it is the USSF 44 mission uh, for the US Space Force. And I hate to break your heart, but this isn't a double RTLS. Yes, it is. Um, yes, it is. Oh, oh, this yep. is the double RTLS. Oh, they which one is it. the we one? We didn't think we didn't think it oh. was. But then the FCC permit came out, and there was no drone ship location. So which oh, means they're not yes. doing the dual drone ship thing. Also, okay. twenty minute event. I was about to mention Tom. Yes. He took that out of my mouth. Um, T minus back to twenty minute events. But yeah. yeah, back to Falcon Heavy. Well, that's how things can change because for the longest time, this was not a dual RTLS. This was going to be a dual drone ship landing and expending the center core. So things change so that you can look forward to your double RTLS. I won't take that away from you, Kelly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the center core will be expended intentionally. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a weird looking Falcon 9, only recovery hardware on the side boosters. Haven't seen that before. But uh, yes, the boosters are coming back to LZ1 and 2. Thomas, you keep stealing everything I'm going to say. <laughs> Oops, sorry. All good. Can, um, the the good thing last... is you cannot lose the center core if you don't try, right? Ooh, very fair. Indeed. And yeah, and, it seems but, like center core recovery. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Go, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, it seems like center core recovery is going to become a bit of a rarity in the future, if it ever happens again at all, because all future missions that we know of are going to be center core expendable or center core and side booster expendable so again plans may change like they have with ussf 44 but it seems like center core recovery is kind of uh going to become a rarity in the future so and i think that's also kind of uh supported by the fact that there's so many center cores being made for falcon heavy whereas not as many side booster pairs um but what were you going to say chris 
Oh, I was I, I was actually just going to go back to the visual that was on the screen right now. Um, actually, um, just to talk a little <laughs> bit about the, what we're seeing visually and what that that means um, to the the countdown here. So this big T minus twenty minute vent is the big purge of the transporter erector. That's the big gray structure that you actually see facing the camera right now uh, with the rocket behind it, and that's because RP one kerosene load into the second stage has wrapped up. And they are going to be preparing for the start of liquid oxygen loading coming up here in a couple of minutes. Um, so all proceeding as planned toward our targeted 7.20 p.m. or 23.20 UTC liftoff of uh, Falcon 9 here with Galaxy 33 and 34. Awesome. And yeah, like Chris was saying, the T minus 20 minute event is happening right now, getting ready for second stage propellant loading, which will happen in just under two minutes now, or sorry, second stage liquid oxygen loading, I should say. Uh, the second stage is being loaded with RP1, um, and it has been since T minus 35 minutes. Uh, but yeah, coming up in a minute and 45 seconds, they'll begin liquid oxygen loading. Um, that's actually a really neat point that I always love is that they load liquid oxygen on the second stage very close to T0. Um, so the and first stage, like I said, um, starts at T minus 35 minutes, but with the second stage starts at T minus 16. Now that is to keep the liquid oxygen as cold and as dense as possible, because with rocket fuel, the denser it is, the more power you can get out of your engines. And with Falcon 9, SpaceX is trying to inch every little bit of power and performance and efficiency out of the rocket that they possibly can. And we've actually seen like like testing different fueling things like timings recently haven't we i do not know yeah, exactly. they they, they yeah. tweaked i forget what it, it was like a very small change i think it was like liquid oxygen loading goes until slightly closer to t0 than it used to or something like that. it is something along the lines of just moving the fueling timeline as close to t0 as possible um, and I know I'm going to just keep stalling because Alex is typing in the back channel, and I remember he knows more exactly what it is, so I'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> well, because, well, because oh, but, yeah, but it's, okay. your, it's your point of trying to eke out the most efficiency from the rocket, right? That That's what they're trying to do, and that's sort of yes. what we see SpaceX continuing to evolve and learn as the system, especially the Falcon system, matures as it has. I mean, th this is about to be the what, 145th landing attempt tonight. <laughs> Of a, of, of a booster. I mean, it's insane the progress they've made. Um, yeah. 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 And, and Alex um, was saying they tested out on some Starlink emissions. It's a bit of a complicated thing, but basically adjusting the fueling timeline ever so slightly to try and get a little bit more performance out of their Starlink emissions. They've messed with other things too. The fairing separation yeah. times has been closer to stage separation. Like basically, as soon as the MVAC is lit, they pop fairings off. And that's another thing. Like the sooner you get those off, the sooner you've shed that weight and the more performance you'll get out of your upper stage. But it's, also, it's a little interesting because it's a very low altitude payload fairing SEP when they do that compared right, to some of the thing. other missions. You're still kind of in the upper regions of the air. You're about at 80 kilometers, the McDowell line, um, when, <laughs> oh when, when you pop the fairings at, at this point. Yeah, yeah I mean... I oh, go ahead, Adrian. I I, I would imagine with the, especially with the Starlings, that they they have a very good understanding what a Starling can endure at this point, and we know that Starlings are built probably a bit more robust. I mean, we saw them literally bump into each other sometimes. I was gonna say, yeah, they bump into each yeah. other during deploy. So yeah, so maybe with Starlings, uh, they can actually do that because they are just a bit more robust built. I would not. I, I would not be surprised if, for example, on a USSF mission, somebody would be like, yeah, you're not deploying this earlier than, <laughs> than we would want to deploy this. Right. Especially and, and if you have of, a super sensitive satellite like they have on the USSF or NRL, NROL missions. Right. Oh, indeed. And, and, you know, like, for those who might be wondering why we're making a big deal out of, you know, like a lower in the atmosphere payload separation is because that does affect the heating profile on the satellite. It's not necessarily about just protecting it from the air pressure as you go up as the rocket is ascending. It's about protecting it from that thermal friction that takes place as, as you're ascending. Um, so popping the payload fairings open lower in the atmosphere exposes them to a higher degree of heating components as as you're ascending into orbit above the above the discernible atmosphere really yeah, yeah and even though the air is thin at that altitude remember how fast the vehicle is traveling the vehicle is very hypersonic at that point and so that's why that heating develops 
And I think one last thing to mention here uh, when we're talking about performance upgrades is that we can actually see some effects of these performance upgrades. So previously, SpaceX has flown 52, maybe 53 Starlink satellites per mission, um, but they've upped it to 54 recently on certain missions. Um, and Elon has even said on Twitter that that is the um, highest payload that Falcon 9's ever taken to orbit. So there are some very visible effects that we can notice of this um, inkling every little bit of propellant and every little bit of performance out of Falcon 9. Yeah. Um, very cool questions. And going back actually to when discussing um, Falcon Heavy before, one quick question um, from Sebastian here is uh, they're asking, why is it so difficult to land the center core of Falcon Heavy? Is it the extra velocity gained by the side boosters? So Chris, why has it been such a pain in the butt to recover the center core? Yeah, so one of the center core recoveries was actually one of the farthest downrange they had ever attempted. It was about a thousand kilometers downrange from the launch site. And for comparison, like today's mission will land 643 kilometers downrange. So I mean, way, I mean, 350 more kilometers downrange. So you're you're going faster at stage separation and and entry you're you're experiencing more heating you're stressing the vehicle out more you've also expended a lot of that propellant because you needed to use that propellant to leave the second stage with enough to do what was required of it um mm -hmm. as well so all of those things sort of came together it's 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 really outside of the nominal operational family that they're used to where these landings take place 300 to 650 kilometers downrange from the launch site yeah, very good answer there, Chris. And uh, while we're getting closer and closer to T0, to we're just over 12 minutes away right now. Uh, if you look at the Falcon 9, things have changed over the past few minutes. If you look at the rocket, you can see some white condensation, some white uh, clouds coming off the rocket. Now, like I said, that's condensation. Uh, so the liquid oxygen inside the tanks are so, so cold that it actually um, produces condensation from the water vapor in the air. Now, this is a lot like if you have a cup of, say, cold water on a very humid, warm day, you'll get some condensation on the side, but this is at a different level because this is a uh, frozen liquid water from the air. Um, so very different effect there, but very cool to see visible effects of propellant loading. Uh, and one last thing here, actually jumping back to what we were discussing about Starlink, um, we actually got some video on orbit from a Starlink satellite that Elon Musk shared on Twitter uh, this of the was satellites so cool. moving around and the second stage deorbiting. This was so cool, Ian, wasn't it? I mean, if, if you, yeah. okay, so in, in the video from Starlinks, if you look up, um, upper right hand corner there's a little white dot you see a flash and then all of a sudden it starts moving away very very quickly um and that is that is the second stage igniting for the deorbit burn and that is how quickly it's a relative velocity compared to the starlings change so at this point the, the yep. it's basically just its own mass and the propellant so its thrust to weight ratio is insane so that deorbit burn imparts a lot of velocity change or delta v very very quickly to lower the orbit for for eventual reentry and disposal and yeah, it's and just also, incredible that one of them caught it yeah i didn't even know they had cameras i wonder if they have cameras on every starlink or just <laughs> testing it on this one mission but either way and also like you said it has a high thrust to weight ratio and it already does from the get-go i uh, know because falcon 9 is recoverable you don't get as long of a first stage burn as you would on say atlas 5 or delta 4 so you need a high thrust second stage to kind of give you more of a push to orbit so the second stage the merlin vacuum engine is extremely powerful for a second stage of its size and you can see it very clearly in that video when it just shoots off um so amazing to see that there and I'd, i hope we can see more shots like that in the future Oh, especially that just I came to mind. Imagine that for a starship. I'll, I'll leave. That oh, that would be incredible. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Watching the Raptors reignite for the deorbit. Oh, that would be yeah. incredible. I'm sure they'll have to do that. Um, but we're coming up just under T minus 10 minutes here. Um, now, as we get closer and closer to the countdown, the next event we're going to be seeing at T minus seven minutes will be engine chill on the first stage. So what that means, they're going to start flowing small amounts of liquid oxygen through the nine Merlin engines on the first stage, just cooling them down and getting them ready for the full flow of liquid oxygen that'll be happening at ignition. Um, now, you don't want to just go from warm engines in the, the humid Florida uh, evening to having super cold liquid oxygen flowing through them. That's how you get cracks. That's how you fatigue your metal. You don't want to do that. So they slowly introduce the cold liquid in there just to get them cooled down and ready for ignition. So that's what we'll be seeing happening in just under two minutes here. 
Uh, but real quick, I want to run through some super chats. We have some more building up here. Again, thank you so much to everyone for your support tonight. We appreciate that. Uh, Roseanne here with $2 saying Falcon Heavy is on schedule for October 27th at 8 p.m. So there's a time there. Very interesting. I did not know uh, the time for that, actually. So thank you, Roseanne. And GameCag here, 2000, 2001 with $20. Uh, no comment, unfortunately, but we still really appreciate your support. Thank you very much for that. And William here saying, just saying hello and looking forward to this launch from their driveway in St. Augustine, Florida. That is incredible. Oh. Hope you can see it tonight, William. Yes, St. Augustine, you will be able to see it from St. Augustine. Yep. Just as a side note here, Falcon Heavy is not scheduled for October 27 at yep. 8 p.m. It has no time right now assigned gotcha yeah. yeah just to clarify that there but yeah best of luck seeing this william we hope you can see it and we hope you see a beautiful jellyfish effect possibly uh so best of luck there and michael williams with 10 pounds here saying no question just thanks for all the work and we appreciate that so much michael thank you so much for that uh now downskated here with five dollars saying uh, got done delivering a semi worth of supplies for Ian recovery. Now they're at a truck stop with a bunch of truckers hoping to see the launch there in South Georgia. Well, downskated, we appreciate all your efforts there. And I'm sure, uh, Chris, I think you're about to go. Yep. If, uh, I, I hope you mean South, 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 South Georgia, like, um, like South of, uh, New Brunswick there. Um, because, uh, any further North, it's going to be really, really, really hard to see this one. Um, D during the climb because you're just a bit too far north so i really hope you mean south georgia there gotcha yeah best of luck downskater we hope you can see even just a little bit of the launch because it's always great to see a rocket launch and thanks for the support and thanks for all you're doing and helping with the hurricane ian recovery uh aaron here has become a capcom member thank you aaron we appreciate your support and we hope you enjoy the access to our members only discord uh now you can get access to our members only discord with tons of amazing conversations happening literally all times of the day uh by becoming a capcom member so thank you very much aaron we hope you enjoy the discord uh jim here saying uh with two dollars just saying simply thanks nasa spaceflight and we appreciate that jim thanks for the support and we, uh, we hope you enjoy the launch and one more from Roseanne here with $20 saying, forgot to up the dollars. Thank you very much, Roseanne. We <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, thank you for all the support you've given us tonight. And you know what I appreciate is that tonight we're going to get the sun below the horizon yes. of Falcon 9. But yesterday's, yeah, there, yeah there's the so shot of like, wow. there's the moon and that that's the sky that Falcon 9 will be going into tonight. So, I mean, just absolutely epic here. But we've got the sun below the horizon tonight. But yesterday for the Starlink mission out of Vandenberg, the sun was very much above the horizon. And Jack got this absolutely epic shot of the Falcon 9 transiting the center of the sun. Um as it lifted off last night and we definitely have this in the store uh in metal prints for you to uh to, to buy because this is absolutely an incredible shot i mean like I, I i'm getting one of these for the wall in my office that is i mean jack just did an incredible job you can see the heat off the bottom of like reflecting off the the sun it's just oh my gosh it's such a really immensely cool image and i mean he nailed it jack absolutely nailed yeah. this one so I, it just absolutely incredible, but this is definitely one I think I think we all want because I mean my jaw dropped when when I saw this. Yeah, that the the framing and everything on that is just perfect. And, you can see sunspots, sunspots, the grid fins, the legs. It's all oh, there. Yes. Like it's all yes. there. It's such a cool photograph. And oh yeah, this is this is one that's definitely yeah. I'm, yeah, I've ordered this one for my wall. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, anyone else who would like to get this on their wall, go to shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Check out not just that print, but also all of our other metal prints, all of our uh, t-shirts, everything that we have on there. So much variety to choose from. I'm sure, I am certain you will find something that you like on our store. So yeah, Indeed. and I have a metal print on my wall right now of Starship 24 doing a static fire, and it is an excellent metal print, if I might say so. Now Indeed. we're coming up here on T minus four minutes. Uh, the next event we're going to be seeing here at T minus one minute, uh, that will be the flight computer beginning the pre-launch -pre checks. The flight computer will then take control of the entire countdown. Uh, they'll begin to pressurize the first stage tanks. Now it's coming up in three minutes here. 
And speaking of the the tanks on the rocket, uh, look at all the condensation there. They are almost fully yeah. fueled, fully loaded with propellant. So much condensation, so much venting. Now, as we get closer and closer to T0, we're going to see the vents on the vehicle and on the strong back start to turn off. Uh, now, you don't want to have a bunch of propellant nearby when you have your rocket engines igniting. Talk to Booster 7 if you want to uh, ask them why that is. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> but... Yep, so everything will be uh, safing the strong back, venting out any extra propellants, but that'll be coming up in the next few minutes, but I'd like to grab a few more questions just before we get uh, to T0. Indeed. Can, can I do a quick flight profile real quick, though, Go Ian, ahead, Chris. Before we get this? Cool, because, yeah, after Falcon 9 lifts off, like you said, the primary job will be to take the 7.3 metric ton duo of Galaxy 33 and 34 into a sub-synchronous geostationary transfer orbit. So they'll actually leave the orbit a little bit below geostationary transfer altitude in terms of apogee or the highest point in the orbit, which is 35,780 kilometers. So they'll leave it a little bit lower than that with a perigee, a perigee of about 200 to 50 kilometers. And then the two satellites after deployment will spend the next 10 to 11 days raising their orbits up to their specific geostationary orbital slots that they will be going to, to take over duties from some previous galaxy satellites as all part of this great C-band clearing for the 5G <laughs> network. And what we maybe should also point out here, since this is a window, but uh, what is specific about Falcon 9 is it has no like wiggle room now once it is locked in for a launch time. So yes. while, yes, this launch window was a launch window, they are now locked in to a certain launch time. They have to launch there. So um, if we see like hold at this point, or something that would abort the countdown that would mean that they can try again uh, tomorrow for the second launch window. Yep. And one thing I'm noticing now is there are pad lights on the rocket. So it's getting dark enough they need to turn the pad lights on. And hopefully that means it's getting dark enough that we'll see a jellyfish effect into the This is the but part again. where Floridians get really excited because yeah. evening and morning and like twilight launches are just absolutely spectacular. They, they rival night launches because of yeah. the, just what the contrails can do. Yeah. Yep. So now we're coming up at T minus one minute, 30 seconds. We could see they're now closing off the transporter erector, getting all the propellant out of it just to make sure there's nothing that can burn inside of it. Um, now at T minus one minute, like I said, they're going to begin to, pr to pressurize the propellant tanks. The flight computer will take control of the countdown. Then at T minus 45 seconds, we'll get the final go for launch from the flight director. Um, now at T minus three seconds, we'll have the engines ignite. And if everything looks perfect on the launch vehicle, we'll have liftoff obviously at T zero. Uh, now we're going to get max Q a minute and 12 seconds into flight. That's when there's going to be the maximum aerodynamic pressure on the rocket. And first stage main engine cutoff will happen at 2 minutes and 33 seconds into flight. And from there, we will guide you. But now we're getting just under T minus 1 minute. Vehicles taking control of the countdown and the tanks are pressurizing for flight. Nice beautiful visuals there of the last vents on the vehicle shutting off and i think at this point we say go falcon 9 go galaxy and go intel sat absolutely and we are go for launch on the flight loop t minus 30 seconds now again because we are a few miles away here it will take a few seconds for the audio abort to and they just called an abort on the mission control audio and, like and that's a hold. All right. So there was an, a hold at um, T minus 30 seconds here in the countdown. Um, uh, and as, as we were just talking about, Falcon 9 has a very, very um, sort of strict fueling sequence that it needs to follow. It has some recycle points that it can get to, uh, but they, it, this isn't as simple as just holding here and waiting for a couple of seconds and continuing on from uh, how the Falcon 9 auto sequence works. So... Um, yeah, this was going to be an absolutely gorgeous uh, possible liftoff here, um, but we'll need to hear exactly what the issue was that um, that caused this hold here at T minus 30 seconds. Um, and we'll obviously, as we do here at NASA Space Flight, wait for the official, official word as to what they are going to do. But um, uh, to, to Adrian uh, here, how long was their launch window um, the today? The whole launch window let me 
put out the the whole launch window was 67 minutes starting at seven uh, at uh, less is it um 707 EDT. Yeah. yeah so the they're already closes started... at 8 14 eastern time yeah that means they are done to my knowledge yep. right they cannot get detank the rocket completely in that time and get into another flow and launch it at the end of the window this would mean that they cannot launch today yep unfortunately now their next launch opportunity is around the same time tomorrow the launch window opens a minute earlier than it did today so that is their next possible opportunity now again it depends on what the issues with the vehicle if it's just a minor software error or a minor hardware error that they can fix at the pad then we might see an attempt tomorrow but and that we not- also need to Oh, sorry. And I also just want to point out too, like we also need to bear in mind that it might not be the rocket that was the problem. There might have been a range fouling involved with aircraft or, or marine traffic as well. Yep, there could have been a ground support issue, maybe even an issue with the satellites, just something that did not look good. So uh, again, we're going to wait on SpaceX's word for what they're doing here. Uh, but the next available opportunity... Uh, and and you see the clock has recycled to T minus 15 minutes, which is a stable hold point for them. But the tricky part here with the Falcon is the temperature of the liquid oxygen. Um, the densified, densified liquid oxygen needs to be at the proper temperatures, which is why they load it so late um, into the vehicle and why fueling only wraps up a couple of minutes. I mean, literally about two minutes or a minute, 30 seconds prior to liftoff is when fueling uh, is completed. Uh, and you can see venting happening there uh, from the Falcon 9 as um, as well. But it, it comes down to that fuel temperature and the density that you need the liquid oxygen to be at for the proper performance of your vehicle that becomes the limiting factor here with these load and go. Oh, sorry, I heard audio and I wanted to just make sure they weren't start uh, going to start talking with an official update there. Um, but yeah, all, all of that is sort of... Um, yeah, just to give context for why the Falcon can't just hold at T minus 30 seconds like some other rockets could um, in, in, in the terminal sequence because it is very, very, very controlled because of the propellant temperatures involved. Yes, and again, we're awaiting SpaceX's word on what they're going to do going forward. Um, but we may not hear actually what the issue is. That's important to keep in mind, but we're just going to hear what their official plan is going forward. They may call it 24 hour scrub, maybe 48 hours, or maybe an indefinite scrub. Now, if you're just yeah. now joining us, we did have a, an abort on the countdown at the T minus 30 second mark. This was an auto abort by Falcon 9. Now, prior ah. to the countdown, uh, the countdown was proceeding nominally. Now, keeping in mind the purpose of the countdown is to help us catch potential issues prior to play. There are thousands of ways a launch can go wrong and only one way that it can go right. Given that we are overly cautious on the ground and if the team or the vehicle sees anything that looks even slightly off, they'll stop the countdown. Now, overall, the vehicle and payload are in good health. The next launch opportunity is tomorrow at 7.06 p.m. Eastern Time. Hopefully, you'll join us again for our next launch attempt. Until then, thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you again next time. Well, there we have it. Uh, confirmation that it is a scrub today, but also uh, an important note there, too, that it was an auto cutoff by the Falcon 9 rocket itself. Um, so not a console operator as it would have been in a range fouling situation. So that does give us some indication, like you were saying, Ian, that it's that, that the something with the ground system, something with the rocket or something with the satellites was caught in the in the final seconds here. Yes, and T minus 30 seconds is actually a common place for a scrub to happen. Um, it seems like that is a place where they do some final checkouts there. But yep, yeah. so very unfortunate today that we lost what would have been a nice opportunity uh, to see a possible jellyfish. But uh, join but us again, tomorrow because the launch time is almost ex- identical. <laughs> <laughs> and just to just to point it out here again, uh, yes, it's super frustrating to see these scrubs. But on the other end, you only have one sh- chance to get it right. Um, it, it you can only yeah fly once, kinda. So it's always good to be a bit more on the cautious side with these payloads and rockets. Yeah, absolutely. And before we leave you guys at the end of this webcast here, I'd like to thank uh, two more people who've given us support tonight. Uh, Brett Newbert with $5 saying, do we know the flight direction of Falcon Heavy? And if I do recall, it is flying directly east. Is that right, Chris? That for is correct, USS yes. 44? Gotcha. So thanks for the support, Brent. We hope that answered your question, as well as Alex Plant. Thanks for being a pad wrap member. We appreciate that, Alex, and we hope you enjoy all the perks that come with your membership. But uh, 
On that, I'd like to thank everyone who's given us support tonight, um, everyone who's don uh, given Super Chats, who's uh, gifted memberships or got their own memberships. Thank you again for all of your support. But uh, on that note, we're going to be calling it here. I'd like to thank everyone who joined me tonight. Thank you, Adrian, for tuning in. Thanks for having me, and I wish everyone a good night later. Absolutely. And thanks, Chris, as well. Indeed, my absolute pleasure. And out in the field, they're providing us this view. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much, Thomas, for everything tonight. Uh, happy to. Hope you all come back tomorrow night for another launch attempt. Yeah, and of course, Michael Baylor operating this live stream in the studio. And uh, I was your host, Ian Atkinson, tonight. Uh, we will hopefully hopefully see you tomorrow if SpaceX does confirm that they are giving a shot in tomorrow's launch window. Uh, but that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. So thanks, everyone, for watching. And we're going to throw you over to Space Coast Live, where you can continue watching some great views of everything happening around Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. We hope you enjoy that. We hope to see you again tomorrow night. Hope you all have a great night, everyone.